Jaws, released in 1975, redefined what it meant to be a Hollywood movie. It became the highest grossing film of all time until Star Wars came two years later and became the model for Hollywood films. Simple premise summer blockbusters supported, importantly, by massive advertising campaigns. But what makes Jules so good? If you think the answer to that question is that it's because it's about a scary shark, then you are wrong, as evidenced by the lack of almost any other good shark film. The film has been interpreted in every imaginable way, from being about Watergate and the atom bomb, to patriarchy and immigration. But I'm going to argue that what makes Jules so good is its unrelenting and flawless commitment to the ideology of capitalism. I think Jules is, for better or worse, ideological propaganda in its purest form. And because it mirrors the society we live in so accurately, in such a subtle way, it is oddly satisfying, warm and powerful. Let me explain. To interpret Jules, I will turn to the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, whose psychoanalytic approach to the study of ideology is both controversial and arguably the most innovative contribution to philosophy of the last 50 years. Unlike Marx, who thought capitalist ideology was a false consciousness, Žižek believes that ideology is consciousness. It presents the topography, the mapping of the world we live in, that the mind then mirrors to give itself context and make sense of the world. Žižek writes that ideology is not a dreamlike illusion that we build to escape insupportable reality. In its basic dimension, it is a fantasy construction which serves as a support for our reality itself. Žižek touches on Jules in the film The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, where he compares Jules to Nazi ideology, what he cites as the most extreme form of ideology. The ordinary German in the 1930s is surrounded by failure. The failure to win the First World War, the failure of capitalism during the Great Depression to sustain the economy, the failure of the Kaiser to protect his citizens. But capitalism has instability at the heart of its structure. It is not a perfect order, but built on growth and recession tugging and pulling between employer and employee, flux between the state and business. Enter the idea of fascism, the idea that despite the chaos that surrounds you, the perfect order can be achieved immune to any antagonism and class struggle. If only you obey and expel the impure, in the case of the Nazis, the Jew. This, Žižek says, is how ideology works at its most fundamental level. If only that imaginary thing that is causing trouble can be removed, the Jew, the immigrant, the scrounger on welfare, then everything will be fine. The object of dissatisfaction then gets lumped with every obvious negative connotation. They are dirty, money-grabbing, selfish, ugly, excessive, gambling, barbarians and aliens. Žižek's ideas are based around the Lacanian psychoanalytic view that the human mind works in a way that gives the illusion of fullness, of completeness, a part of which covers a negative gap that can never really be fulfilled. There is a basic lack in our mind's very constitution that drives the mind towards filling that gap. It's the gap that keeps us in motion, like the treat hanging at the end of the treadmill. This basic structure of the mind is then mirrored in ideology. In Christianity, for example, Jesus died for our sins, so that we can achieve fullness in the afterlife, if only we live in a certain prescribed way. For Žižek, as a Marxist, the fundamental antagonism under capitalism is class struggle against capital. The opening scene of Jules sets this tone of ideological fantasy, an imaginary fullness, a complete idealistic life. 
white picket fences, a police chief that fixes swings, the only threat, kids karateing those perfect picket fences. There's no need for beach closed signs. Even the military march sets the tone of uninterrupted order. Spielberg's genius fondness for traditional painted signs even have a place here. The point is that everything is in its place. But according to Lacanian psychoanalysis, there is no such thing as this symbolic completeness. And the inevitable lack, because it's painful, is covered by fantasy that temporarily gives the illusion of such completeness. The shark serves as this lack that severs idealised fullness. Zizek frequently cites anecdotes that illustrate how impossible contradictions present themselves in everyday life. For example, when the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst asked his editor why he did not want to go on his holidays, the editor replied, I'm afraid that if I were absent for a couple of weeks, the sales of the newspaper would fall. But I'm even more afraid that in spite of my absence, the sales would not fall. Elsewhere, Zizek's pointed out how every boring aphorism has an opposite and contradictory aphorism. Better safe than sorry, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, but never too old to learn. Birds of a feather flock together, but opposites attract. What's important is that the human mind is attracted to the single simple idea that answers everything that ties everything together in a nice, neat bundle. Jules plays on this imaginary fullness. The town hall, the scene of idealised, direct democracy. Almost utopian today. And what better way to symbolise the intruder threatening complete freedom than invoking Independence Day and American flags next to the shark jewel stand. But the threat of closing the beach serves as the nightmare of the gap, of the lack, of that contradiction that can't be overcome. The real nightmare is not the shark, but the lack of business. As this lady says of closing the beach. Only 24 hours. 24 hours like the impossible situation between the threat of death by shark, or alternatively, maybe worse, the lack of business, is like the contradiction between the opposite aphorisms. So this sets the film up, but the different positions of the three or four central characters are Spielberg's, or the author of the novel Peter Benchley's, stroke of genius. The mayor represents capitalism in its purest. He can't fathom the idea of the beach closing, of business suffering. Even his anchor pattern jacket symbolises that he is the corporeal embodiment of the community. He is identifiable with the purest utilitarian profits and interests of Amity Island. Of course, there are limits to capital in real life. Monopolies must be regulated, taxes collected for the welfare of the community, unions formed to protect workers, and Chief Brody becomes the voice of reason that represents all this, that balances the sometimes irrational flow of capital, the mayor. Brody represents the state, which under capitalism has a monopoly on questions of law, morality and justice. Take a look at this scene. I just found out that a girl got killed here last week. And you knew it. You knew there was a shark out there. <laughs> you knew it was dangerous. But you let people go swimming anyway. Three figures of authority, capital, the state and the scientist, are confronted with the mourning mother, dressed in black. It wasn't necessarily Brody's fault that the beaches weren't closed. But he's the one that gets slapped because the state is the place where questions of morality have their final jurisdiction. The responsibility ultimately falls on Brody's shoulders. Cut then to this scene, highlighting the supposedly pure intentions of the state, the desire to do the right thing, highlighted by the connection with the most innocent thing of all, a child. 
The impossible contradiction here is that there is no right thing to do. If the beach is closed, people starve. If they stay open, people get eaten. Of course, the next thing to do rationally is to consult science, empirical facts, the data, the next figure of authority. But as it turns out, science has the ability to describe, but not to act. Facts aren't moral, hence this exchange. I'm telling you the crime rate in New York will kill you. There's so many problems, you never feel like you're accomplishing anything. Violence, rip-offs, muggings. Kids can't leave the house, you gotta walk them to school. But in Amity, one man can make a difference. In 25 years, there's never been a shooting or a murder in this town. Now, here, I think, is what makes the film so good. In reality, these contradictions can't be resolved. They are structural. But according to Lacan, the mind does a good job of fantasizing ways of overcoming them, and this provides us with what he calls imaginary structure. Enter Quint from outside the structural order. He is an uncomfortable presence. He doesn't fit into society. But he doesn't fit into society for the exact reasons that society needs him now. He lives outside the moral code, but the moral code, the law, according to Lacan, relies on an excess, a stain, a fantasy that holds the law in place, gives it its reason to be. We have to be able to fantasize of ways to transgress the law, to give the law its meaning, and Quint is that transgression. He is the drinking and the smoking and the fighting and the prostituting that has to be experienced by someone, something, some fantasy, to remind society why they cannot do those things all the time. He wants the brandy, the caviar, the colour TV, the bow-legged women, all the excesses of capitalism. This transgression, then, is both excluded and included in the moral order at the same time. Zizek's ideas about ideology don't just apply to capitalism. He argues that while the fundamental antagonism under capitalism is class struggle, under totalitarian communism exists because the party, the state, has a monopoly on everything, practically and morally, and so cannot admit to its own faults or failures. This logic plays out in the trial of the communist leader Bukharin in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. The accusations against him are false, and everyone knows it, but Bukharin knows he must admit guilt for the good of the communist ideal, despite knowing he's innocent. Stalin's show trials had to be visible, he had to be seen to be dealing with the problems the people faced, so that they didn't lose faith in the system. Bukharin's crimes, like Quint, are a fantasy, developed to deal with an impossible situation. Because Quint is immune from the rules of society, he has the capacity to deal with the impossible contradiction. He is the fantasy that there will always be something, some way, of getting out of an impossible situation. Quint is the fiction. This is why Quint is the fantasy element that covers the antagonism, because when it comes to realising the fantasy, it turns out not to be able to solve anything at all. As with all fantasies, once we act them out, they lose their power of attraction. But ironically, out on the sea, away from society, Quint actually cares, another idealised fantasy. Hey, your head's bleeding. First aid there. We realise then, in the best speech of the film, that Quint is an outsider because he paid the ultimate sacrifice for society and got betrayed in return, linking the shark with the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, an event that ended a war that tested the limits of the expansion of capital, another contradiction. Of course, ultimately, this outsider that doesn't play by the rules can't be the one to save the day. His eccentricities, his unwillingness to listen to reason and science, eventually kills him, and to hit home the impossibility of Quint saving the day, that he is just a fantasy, 
His death is the worst of the film, almost even on dry land. Eventually, and here's where Jules's ideology at its purest, it's the state that saves the day. The incorruptible good guy that is the government. This, though, was in the 70s, and today, as the power of narratives and what Zizek calls symbolic efficiency diminishes, people are less and less inclined to believe in any kind of powerful, legitimate authority. The idea of Quint and the shark together, for example, demonstrates the psychological attraction of conspiracy theories to explain the world. A lot of them have the same fundamental structure, that there is something hidden outside of society that both controls and simultaneously has the power to liberate us, but is impossible to pin down. Zizek writes that it would be productive to conceive conspiracy theory as a kind of floating signifier which could be appropriated by different political options to obtain a minimal cognitive mapping. Between 1965 and 1970, the number of shopping malls in America had skyrocketed from 1,500 to over 12,000. Before Jules, the biggest films of the year had traditionally been released in winter, but with air-conditioned mega shopping centres and a newly wealthy generation of consumers, Jules completely changed the landscape of movie promotion. $2.5 million was spent on TV advertising, still new at the time, and the studios hit upon the idea of promotional goods. Jules t-shirts and ice creams were everywhere. The film experience suddenly became inextricably intertwined with the consumer experience. And because of this, I think the subtle message behind Jules might just be, ignore the threat of death, Ignore the fact that the ebbs and flows of capitalism are out of your control. Continue on. Consume. Everything will be okay. Everything is under control. Like the Derrida video last week, I'll put a recommended reading list for Zizek in the description below. And if you buy through those links, I'll get a small commission which will really help this channel out. If you want to see more, you can also subscribe to Then and Now and please hit the like button below. And if you're feeling really generous, you can support me by pledging as little as a dollar per video on Patreon. Thanks for watching.